This song is my most favorite song of my whole life. And it's it's just it's like the essence of the heart. The song comes out of great suffering of the man who wrote it. And um, he lost all his children, he lost his business and his home in the fire in Chicago way back, I don't remember the dates, long, long ago. And he's the one that wrote the song on the very spot. He was traveling by ship from America to England to be with his wife. She had gone over before him, and on the way the ship sank with his wife on it and, and his children, and she was the only one saved. So he was going to see his wife. He had lost all his children, one of them before from, from sickness in Chicago. And as his ship passed over the spot, it seemed like the spot because the captain called him, said, this is the spot where your wife's ship went down. And he went down to his cabin and he wrote these words to the song. So it comes from great suffering and great loss, but it is the essence of of forgiveness and love and you you just read the words and hear the words of this song. <clears throat> it is well with my soul.
It is only well with my soul, I know, because I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm not a perfect person. I do so many things wrong and I'm so mad at myself sometimes. But it is because of Jesus that I'm actually clean and I stand right with God. There's no way to stand right with God if we come on our own merits. If we try, I know a lot of people try to be really good people and I know people myself that come here for piano lessons. I know people that are wonderfully good people. Um, I myself said to my mom once, I said, my granny is like so perfect, she's like an angel, you know, and my granny herself told me I'm not an angel. Well, anyway, <coughs> what I'm saying is nobody can come to God on their own merits. It doesn't matter if we try to be good. Sometimes maybe we've told a lie or we've done, uh, stole something or anything like that. And that is why our sins have been nailed to the cross with Jesus. And that's what the song says. That's why the man says, it is well with my soul. Just because of the grace of God. But you have to ask for that forgiveness in order to get Jesus Christ and His righteousness. Without Him, you're going to stand one day and answer for everything you've done in life. And if you, if you think your own righteousness is going to stand up, uh, yeah, you, can just, you can just think about the things you've done wrong in your life. I've done so many, it would take a couple of volumes to fill it up. So I don't, I don't think about going to heaven on my own righteousness, but because of Christ's righteousness, and I have to ask for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have to ask for Him to come in. If I don't ask, the invitation is out. Each one of us have got an invitation card, and they come regularly all through our life. It's repent of your sins. Ask God forgiveness. And then it's receive Jesus as your Savior. You're receiving Him as your righteousness. It's as if you've never sinned. And it doesn't mean that I'm, I suddenly become such a good person and I don't sin anymore. I do. I'm naturally a sinner like everybody else. Yeah. We're naturally inclined to sin. It's just the law, the law out there, the fear of the law, of the cops and the courts that keeps most people behaving themselves. Really, I know there's a lot of people that wouldn't break the laws or try not to. But there's always a time that we do. And we need a righteousness not from ourselves, but from outside. That's the only righteousness that God the Father will accept on the day of judgment. And so I'm happy and thankful to have responded finally to one of those invitations right at the last moment, right at the point of suicide. I finally, my pride, I swallowed it for the first time. And I received that invitation. And he changed me miraculously on that day. Like I told you, not that I'm a good person. Forget about it. <clears throat> I've got the natural inclination, uh, like we all have. But <clears throat> it's that he cleansed me by his righteousness. So in Christianity, I always say to people this very thing. Christianity is not behavior modification. So if you think it is, that's not the true Christianity. If, if I can change myself and become righteous, I know what kind of person I am inside. I can pretend to other people that I'm righteous out of my own good deeds. But if I really search my own heart, there's no ways that I can be righteous. It's just a pretense. <clears throat> It's a behavior modification. And when you become a true Christian, it's not you changing you. It's God changing you. He changes you. It's His work. Yes. Right to the very end, it's His work. You'll find yourself starting to change. Your very nature starting to change. It's not that you've now got a new book of rules and a set of rules. And now that you've become a Christian, you have to obey. The very things you couldn't obey before you became a Christian. But now suddenly you're going to obey them because you suddenly made this commitment to study the Bible, go to church, sing songs, do good things. You're still the same person inside. So behavior modification is play acting. And Jesus said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, <coughs> hypocrites, play actors all. So behavior modification is not Christianity. Christianity 
is surrendering to God, asking forgiveness and asking Christ to come into your heart and be your Savior, your righteousness. And watch yourself be changed by God's hand, not yours. Let God change you. Don't try and behave differently. That is not Christianity. I think that puts a lot of people off Christianity when, when some churches say, come in and become just like us. And people look at some of them, some of them, not all of them by any means, but look at them and say, you guys are hypocrites. And you pretend to be like this, but I've seen you outside of the church. You're not, you don't behave the same way. <clears throat> and so I say to people, look, it's good news. The good news is not that I'm going to change my behavior and make it this time. I couldn't make it the last time. I couldn't make it the last hundred times. And I wouldn't make it the next hundred times. So the good news is, there's this invitation. It's an invitation from God. It's to every one of us. And it's given to us over and over and over. All the opportunities we've had <clears throat> and refused to listen. It's this. The end of this life. I tell you what, it comes so quickly. The gravestone is not too far in the future. And we can walk amongst the gravestones in the graveyard, right? And not many people want to go there for a day off and spend the time there. No. I say to Kathy, my wife, we must go there every now and again and look at the names on the grave and say, hmm, what car did this guy drive? What kind of house did this person stay in? Did they have a huge multi-million bank balance? And then <clears throat> what happened at the funeral when that person died? Were all the relatives there, were they really weeping? Were they saying, how much am I going to get? And, and all the money that the person gathered is no longer with that person. When you're in the grave, it's gone. We take nothing from this side to the other side. But the, the one thing that we can take and it doesn't belong to the world, <clears throat> is the forgiveness of Christ and the salvation of Christ. That is the one eternal gift that God gives us right here. And we can walk with that. It's like a ticket to a, to a theater. When you get up to heaven, if, if you stand there and it's the entranceway, and the angel or somebody says to you, <clears throat> why should I let you in? If you start saying, and you say, do you have a ticket? You say, what do you mean ticket? Don't you know who I am? <laughs> I'm the big K. I built 60 churches, but I did this, I did that. I, oh, I fed the poor. I so, hey, have you got a ticket? I don't know what ticket you're talking about. No, no call your boss. Hey, call your boss. <clears throat> and the angel may call the boss. And <laughs> the boss is Christ and comes over and the guy says, hey, don't you remember me? I built all these churches. I did all these good deeds. I did... And Jesus says, hey, well, I never knew you. Oh, I never knew you. And he said, yeah, but you must know me. No, I never knew you. You did all that really for yourself. And you didn't let me save you or change you. And there it is. The one other person comes with the invitation. They may look raggedy and may have been poor in life even. Maybe they were rich, but they had the invitation. And so... <clears throat> come to the angel, the angel sees it, you may enter in, because it's not your righteousness that will get you to heaven. And there is a heaven. And there is a dark place. A place of separation from God, who is the source of life. It's just how it is. I know it's politically incorrect these days to preach Christianity, and it's going to become illegal in the future. Because Satan doesn't want you saved. Yes. And he doesn't want you to even believe he exists. Yes, especially. It's a great cover, don't you think? What camouflage? What bit of camouflage is that? So I'm saying to you, when you get into your tight spot, your depressed spot, like me, a suicidal spot, when you get to where you cannot get away anymore, <clears throat> turn to God. He takes us even when we've been treacherous uh, and his enemy for forever. Yes. If you turn, even at the last moment, He will save you if you call out and ask. And that is when God changes you. And then it's not a hypocrisy. You must stand with the truth. I don't like a lot of the TV ministries 
that, that pick bits and pieces up and, and live like multi-billionaires and kind of rob the poor. Yes, exactly. I, I believe in the truth. And sometimes the truth is quite ugly. Uh, when you look in the mirror, sometimes the truth has exposed me. And <clears throat> God's got a way of doing that. As I say, He changes you. And when He changes you, He shows you something He's known as there all along. He, he's known. But I didn't know. So He puts a little bit of pressure on your life. <clears throat> and you start to come apart at the seams. And a bit of steam comes out of the top of the pot. You know, and you start, you can't hide this stuff. And people look at you and you go, oh no, they see me. I can't, I can't keep this up. But God turns that pressure there. And all of a sudden, all the, dr all the yuck boils to the top. And you can no longer deny to God that it's there. You're kind of like saying, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. And that's, that's our flesh. Our flesh is still trying to qualify for heaven. It's not going to make it. It's, it's the spirit that's going to go to heaven. The flesh is going back to dust in the earth, right where the graveyards are that I spoke about. You don't have to pay for a plot there. They, they milk you dry till your last days. But all I'm saying to you, if you ask God forgiveness with your voice, wherever you are, and ask Jesus to come in and be your Lord and Savior, something will happen to you. I guarantee it. Because God is calling us. What happens when someone's calling you and you respond? That person knows you've responded immediately because they've been calling you. Ah, it makes perfect sense. So I'm saying there's no way that you're going to save yourself. There's no way that you're going to behave yourself into the future kingdom. Impossible. And there is a heaven and a hell. There really is. Yes. I know because I've kind of been on the other side. Yeah. Already on the other side. <clears throat> so my advice to you, and that's why the song means so much to me too. It is surrender your life. Watch how fast the gravestone is coming for us. And some of us, it comes as a shock and a surprise, suddenly. But even if we live a full life and don't die of some accident, life flies by incredibly fast. And that confidence and security that you've had, <clears throat> it dwindles in the last days. As your body gets weaker and as people, young people, despise you because you're old, you know nothing. They know everything. You know how it is. We were once young. We think we could teach them. That's how the world has become. So I say to you, if you're in need, call on Him. Call on Jesus. He will answer you like He answered me. Thank you.